Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today for our session on what the end of COVID restrictions means for employers. Before we get started, though, just a few introductions. Um, I'm Francesca Rove. I'm a director at Moore Kingston Smith. We are a firm of accountants and business advisors with a dedicated media specialist office. We've got a team of over 100 individuals there working exclusively with clients in marketing services, film and TV, entertainment, theatre and the media tech sectors. And we really use this sector knowledge and expertise so that we can support our clients on their growth journeys, both here in the UK and also internationally. Now, this afternoon, I'm joined by my colleague, Jess Wallace, who is an HR consultant. Um, in her role, Jess works with agencies in the sector on a variety of bespoke projects, all with a focus on making sure that agencies get the most out of their people. Now, the session today is going to have a look at how you as an employer can create and deliver your new COVID policies now that restrictions have ended here in the UK. So Jess has got a short presentation for us to start with, and then there's going to be the opportunity for questions at the end of the session. If you do have questions, please use the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, that just means it's easier for me to keep track of them and make sure we've covered them off um, one by one. So I will hand over to Jess. Thanks, Frank. So I'm just going to share my screen. So hopefully you can all see the slides. Can you see that? OK. No, not yet. It hasn't shown up yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. yeah. OK. So we've obviously spent the last few years getting used to the restrictions implemented for the coronavirus pandemic and attempting to just accommodate them within the workplace whilst trying to keep up to date with the numerous government changes in the rules and regulations. So now that the restrictions have been lifted, it's actually almost as hard to interpret and to understand as, as when they were first implemented um, and exactly what is expected of employers moving forward. So as a starting point, each, each employee will have experienced a completely different journey with COVID and during the periods of lockdown. So moving forward, it's likely to continue affecting different people in different ways. And the thing is, there doesn't appear to be a black and white answer to any of the common employer questions. So a lot of what we cover today, it will depend on your business reasons um, and on your employees' individual circumstances. So there are two things you'll probably hear me mention over and over again. So just as a starting point, so the, the government have, as I'm sure you're already aware, they've continued to gradually lift their guidance on restrictions since February, with April seeing almost all of the previous, previous guidance being lifted. So just to start going over the key changes that are now going to affect the previous rules that employees put in place which will be the removed requirement to self-isolate following a positive test result or close contact with somebody who has tested positive for COVID. Uh, the removed requirement to test daily after contact with a positive case. The end of self-isolation support payments, uh, the provisions of SSP and the support allowance that we had with previous periods of lockdown the ended obligation for individuals to tell their employers in the case of a positive test result, the majority of event venues, uh, which are no longer requiring the use of the NHS COVID pass, and of course, the end of free COVID testing being available to the general public. So with all of those changes and restrictions being eased, this has left the majority of employers questioning how they should continue to monitor COVID and how to support and accommodate their staff moving forwards. So in the next few slides, we'll just cover up some of the most common areas that employees are looking for clarification on at the moment. So starting with COVID testing. So 
employees, they can request that their staff do still take COVID tests. Um, but really, th this is going to come down to whether or not you have a strong business reason to do so. Um, so typically, a strong business reason uh, would be for a high risk industry. So say, for example, um, a company that handles food products or uh, a healthcare um, industry. So that does, of course, mean that it, it could pose a potential issue to, to media companies to establish a, a strong, genuine business reason as those two examples aren't, aren't so likely to apply. But if relevant to your business, what you could try to do is rely on reasons such as having close contact with an excessive amount of people. So say, for example, if you're hosting major events, um, or you could try to rely on the fact that you have close contact with um, a high number of vulnerable employees or clients or customers. So if you can establish a genuine or a strong business reason uh, to continue COVID testing, um, then the first thing you need to do is just ensure that that is written into a policy um, so that that can be circulated and really clearly communicated with all of your employees. Um, and it, on top of that, it, it will be important for you to still gain your employees' consent to continue asking them, them to test. So gaining consent, it, it doesn't need to be really formal or, or like a consultation process. It, it can be something as informal as just asking them to confirm their consent on an email or even just signing quite a basic form. So one thing you'll need to be clear on is just setting your expectations of exactly when or how often you require those tests to be taken. So say, for example, asking employees to take a test every single day before they attend the workplace or, or the office. Um, in that case, I would say that you would need a very strong business reason. Um, so it's not going to be appropriate for everybody. But alternatively, you could reduce the amount that you're asking people to test. So that could be before or after a major company event, um, as we covered earlier, if, they, if your employees are coming into close contact with, with a large number of people. Um, or alternatively, that you could just request that your employees take a test if they're displaying symptoms of COVID. So, you know, basically just do, do the decent thing. If, if you think you, you may have COVID or you're displaying symptoms, please just take a test on the, before you attend the office. So if employees do refuse to provide their consent, uh, you'd need to ensure, again, that you have a very strong business reason to discipline them for, for failing to, to follow a reasonable management request. And lastly, on that point, it's important to remember that as a government, they're obviously they're no longer providing those free tests. That does mean that you as the employer, you're going to be responsible to, to cover any costs associated with, with uh, COVID testing. So moving on to masks. Um, so again, yes, you can still request that your employees wear masks. Uh, but again, uh, it would come down to whether you can establish a valid business reason to enforce it, as we covered in the previous slide. So in a typical office environment, it may be quite difficult to enforce, um, you know, asking everybody to wear a mask um, every single day uh, and for the duration of the time that they're in the office. Uh, it's not likely to be seen as reasonable. Um, but again, as with the last slide, if, if you do rely on the facts, you know, at events or if you're dealing with high numbers of general public or clients, then it, it may be considered more reasonable. So as before, if you do want to request that of your staff, um, then again, you'd need to ensure that that is written into a policy um, and also added into your risk assessment, uh, which would need to state that face masks are required uh, in what situations and exactly why they're required. So some employees may, of course, refuse to wear face masks, um, especially as it's no longer a government requirement. So I'm sure you'll notice as, as soon as the um, government requirements eased and you didn't have to wear masks in shops anymore then obviously 99% of the people that, that you see now instantly just just wanted to, to take them off so it's important to remember that that, that would you know if, if you ask employees to all of a sudden wear them again you, you're going to probably get some pushback um so it's important to to just consider um that before before trying to implement disciplinary action for, for those individuals who are refusing um, and just listen to, to their reasons why. So it, it could be for a genuine reason rather than just being awkward, uh, such as underlying health um, or medical conditions or concerns. 
and it's definitely not advisable to request that only your non-vaccinated staff wear face masks. Uh, that will pose quite a high risk of discrimination. Um, so any policies that you do implement on that matter, you just need to ensure that it treats all employees fairly and equally and it's rolled out consistently across the board. And moving on to insisting employees return to the workplace. So this is one a topic that's come up a lot with our clients for sure. So employees, they do of course have the right to make to, to ask that their employees actually return to their main place of work, uh, whether that's permanently or on a part-time basis under something like a hybrid working plan. Um, but again, you might find that you're getting quite a lot of pushback from staff, um, especially if, if that is something that, that's requested out of the blue. Um, and even more so, uh, I'd say typically if you've got a um, employee base that have been able to, to work from home full time uh, during the pandemic and they've been able to manage their workload and their usual duties over the last few years and, and suddenly they're, they're asked to come back to work on a full time basis. Uh, it, it's going to be a case of, well, I've done it for the last few years, so, so why can't I carry on doing it moving forward? Um, so as the employer, again, uh, you should really just be seen to consider individual cir personal circumstances um, and assess it on a case-by-case -case basis if you do start to receive objections from certain members of staff when you ask them to return to the office. So of course, everybody's personal circumstances, they are going to differ, um, but there, there's still a large amount of employees that are nervous about the continuing effects of COVID, especially if they have close vulnerable relatives um, or if they consider themselves vulnerable. Um, and there's just a lot of anxiety for, for quite a few people still about just returning back to society, just going back to normal after the, the sudden drop in restrictions. So obviously people have spent the last few years being told that they can't do certain things. Um, so for that to just, just be dropped all of a sudden, it, it does cause quite a bit of anxiety. So it's just important to really understand employees' reasons for, for their objections. So a good start, it, it could be easing staff back in, into the workplace under something like a hybrid working plan if, if you've not already got that implemented. Um, that way you could ask your staff just to come back to the office a day or, or two days each week um, and you can gradually increase that over time um, if it is your intention to get everybody back to work on a permanent basis eventually. Um, but if your employees can't carry out 100% of their duties from home then of course that's going to instantly give you a much stronger business reason to insist that they do return to, to the workplace on a permanent basis. Um, and on a similar note, if you say, for instance, during the pandemic when people had to work from home, if you had documented your concerns over a certain individual's productivity or performance, um, then again, that would instantly put you in a much stronger position to request that that employee um, spends either all of their time or just more time in the office under the supervision of their managers. So moving on to asking positive cases to stay away from the office. So the legal requirement to self-isolate has, of course, been removed. Um, but however, the guidance is still in place that advises that positive cases, they do still stay at home and they avoid contact with other people. So there's nothing wrong with employers to, mir to mirror that guidance um, and just set out their expectations to employees. Uh, that, you know, if you test positive, you should stay at home. Um, and that can just be written into a policy and clearly communicated amongst everybody to, to set expectations. Um, if your employees are able to work from home, uh, then that, of course, is a good first step in, in deterring them from, from coming to the office when they're unwell. Uh, it would be the same for any contagious illness like cold or flu symptoms. Um, in it, well, that, that would just stop them from infecting other employees and, and basically doing the decent thing, which, of course, we'd like all of our employees to do. Um, but that, of course, it's only going to be appropriate if the employee's symptoms are minor and they do genuinely feel well enough to, to continue working. Uh, if the employee is really, really unwell um, and got more serious symptoms, then, of course, they probably would call in sick anyway. Um, so so that, that would help avoid the problem. Um, but for those in a role where they are unable to work from home at all, then as the employer, if 
you, you would be the one that, that would therefore be making the decision for them not to attend work. Um, so that would be technically classed as a medical suspension. Um, and a medical suspension would mean that you as the employer are responsible responsible to consider um, to continue to pay their normal salary, even though they're not working. Um, it's not yet been tested in the courts, but the alternative option to medical suspension could be that you just treat any such absences as sickness, uh, which would mean that those employees are therefore entitled to their usual company sick pay or statutory sick pay, whichever you have in place, um, in line with their, their contractual entitlements. So if that is the route that, that you'd like to take, um, despite obviously it being aware that it's not yet tested in the courts, uh, it would just be advised to make sure that you do implement that into a very clearly written policy. So asking employees about their vaccination status. So this is one that has come up quite a lot um, and quite controversial, uh, controversial, but you, yes, you can ask employees about their vaccination status. However, as it is information that relates to their health, you do need to ensure that you gain their consent in order to process such data. So as with any medical information, employees do of course reserve the right not to provide their consent so they don't have to tell you whether or not they've had vaccination. Um, and of course, as the employer, you can't force them to provide that. Um, so in that case, if they, if they were to put, um, not, not provide consent, you cannot penalize them in any way um, or, take disciplinary action. Um, but if you do want to make the decision to ask your employees to provide their consent, best practice would be, again, as with other areas that, that we've just gone through, uh, to, to create a form that gathers that information consistently across the board. And then we're ensuring that everyone's providing the same information and, and being treated the same. Um, an important note on that point is just that that information is classed as a special category data under GDPR. So you would just need to make sure that, that you understand those rules and take the relevant precautions just to ensure that the data is being kept confidentially and, and securely. So in conclusion, the key areas to, to consider uh, would be, of course, your, your business reasons, as, as I've mentioned throughout. Um, so the stronger business reason you have, the more likely it is that any decisions that you make, whether that's implementing strict rules or disciplining those that go against them, that they're going to be deemed as both reasonable and proportionate. And be reasonable and accommodate individual circumstances where possible. So as we've discussed, if you just remember that everybody's journey with COVID, it will have been different. So just being seen to be listening and understanding, it should go a really long way with you being deemed as, as being reasonable. Um, and as, as I mentioned earlier, it's just important that you assess individual circumstances on a case by case basis. Um, a lot of issues that, that you have come up will more than likely be relating to employees' concerns over health. Um, so it's important to remember that you do have an obligation as the employer to make reasonable adjustments for those people that do have pre-existing health concerns or potential disabilities. And consider hybrid working plans that suit both the business needs and your employees. So of course it, it does have to, to work for both, um, but it, it is something that could really help ease employees back into your new ways of working and, and back to society and back to, to normal ways again. Um, and in hybrid plans, they can, of course, pretty much look however you want them to. So it, it does help you as the employer control um, or maintain some type of control and, and flexibility. And set your expectations and communicate them clearly at each stage a change is implemented. So it's a really overlooked thing, but communication, it really is key to just ensure that all employees are aware of their obligations and their expectations. Um, keeping them regularly updated with any changes and why. It should just help ease their concerns and potentially reduce the amount of objections that you receive. And treat all employees, regardless of their vaccination status or beliefs, fairly consistently. So a simple one, but it, it's just important that employees do remember that um, to avoid the risk of discrimination claims moving forward. And lastly, just talk to employees, listen to the feedback and support their concerns where you can. Thanks, Jess. That was really good. Lots to kind of take in and I'm sure um, 
lots of organizations have kind of already had to get to grips with some of their policies post COVID, but some really um, great points that you brought out. If anyone on the call has got some questions, please do put them in the Q&A, but I have got a couple that are here. So firstly, we've got one where they say, I have an employee who has been able to work from home throughout the pandemic without having any issues, but they are now reluctant to return to the office in line with our plans to bring everybody back. They've said that it's because they consider themselves still vulnerable and they're not comfortable returning to a busy workplace or commuting on a train with lots of people. What are their options? What can they do in this situation if they do really want to try and get everybody back into the office? Okay, um, really it would it would come down to what the employee's ailment is um, and why they consider themselves vulnerable. Uh, it sounds likely from what you said that there could be a pre-existing health concern which, which could be considered a disability. So that, that loops back to my point that obviously there has always been that obligation on employers to consider reasonable adjustments for employees with disabilities. So that's irrespective of whether, whether it's related to COVID or not. So I'd probably recommend it in that case that the best first port of call would be to set up a welfare meeting with the employee. Um, just so firstly you can find out more about what the underlying health concern actually is um, and what measures might need to be put in place um, and then you can decide you know if, if they're reasonable for you to, to implement as a business. Um, I mean, you could discuss if, how you can accommodate special requests for their return. Uh, what, what you may find in that situation uh, is it could be something as simple as just altering their, their start or their finish time um, so that they can avoid busy rush hours and public transport or even the busiest days in the office. Um, you know, not everybody really wants to work on Monday or Friday anymore, so you find they're a lot quieter. So it could be as simple as that. But of course, if, if it's something a, a bit more serious, then of course, we've still got the, the usual route that we'd recommend when it, when it comes to employees and their health, which would be occupational health. Um, if you were to set up an occupational health referral, of course, you get to understand a bit, a bit more about the, the employee's ailment um, and, of course, get a professional medical opinion on, on what you can do to support them in, in reasonable adjustments. OK, now that, that is really good. Um, I've got another one here. So we recently implemented a hybrid working structure where we set team collaboration days as mandatory once per month. In general, this has been received well and we've had no push pushback. However, one employee seems to be deciding off their own back not to attend the team collaboration days with no prior warning or having gained any authorization from anybody else. They say that they don't have a strong business reason to bring everybody back um, other than just wanting to kind of get some normality back with everybody being in the office for kind of team morale and dynamics um, as far as they can see there isn't any particular reason that this individual is refusing to attend other than for their own convenience um, what can they do about this is this a kind of disciplinary route what what, what are the options or, or course that we'd suggest uh, potentially yes it, it could be cause for disciplinary so as I say there, there's no black and white answer with this and it, it, it all does come down to individual circumstances and assessing things on a case-by-case -case basis but uh, what, what I'd recommend is speak to her first of all to find out the real reason behind the refusal so what you could do is actually handle that through an investigation meeting um, if you handle the initial conversation as an investigation then if she provides absolutely no valid reason for, for refusing to attend and it does appear just to be you know conduct and potentially an attitude issue um, then you have the right to escalate it up to disciplinary, um, which would likely be a failure to, to adhere to a reasonable management request. Um, but in, in that circumstance, I'd, 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 I don't think a, a strong disciplinary sanction would really fit. Um, you'd probably have to start out quite low, say, for instance, a verbal warning or a, a, a first written. Um, I think if you were to jump in with, with a final written warning or attempt dismissal it's not very likely to be considered as reasonable um, but again on the flip side if, if she were to provide some mitigating circumstances during that 
uh, investigation meeting, then you may change your mind because it could be she's just got concerns over the health and safety or even her own health or just nervousness that she's just not voiced to, the, to date. Um, so in that case, then you could end the investigation there and you wouldn't have to necessarily escalate it. And you could just do, do what you can as an employer and, and listen and see what you can do to support and ease her back into the workplace and feel her, make her feel more, more comfortable. Yeah, no, that makes sense. We've got another one where um, someone said that all their staff um, seem to be happy with working from home and they haven't got a policy whereby they have asked everybody to come back in. Would you recommend in, in this instance that they keep a flexible working style or aim to get everybody to come um, back into the office over a period? I suppose the question is whether or not, um, you know, kind of, Broadly speaking, we think there's a really good case for for doing that, or if there's been any anything that shows that people are more productive or, or happier being in the office. Yeah, this is something I've covered with, when I've done webinars on, on hybrid working. That you know, it's that there's no one size fits all. It's it's completely different for every single company, and that's obviously what works for them as a business and what works for the employee so it is about employee preference as well so if there's no issue with employees working from home and they're happy to allow them to to do so then of course there's absolutely no issue with, with allowing that to continue um few things that you may want to consider of course is potentially if, if you're making their main location from work home would be a change to their contract um you'd probably need to update their main location of work um but also just remaining some control and flexibility as the employer so what you don't want to do is allow them to work from home 100 percent of the time without ever requesting them to come to the office because if you do have performance issues um or if you do eventually get concerns over something like productivity if, if you do need to call them back to the office it, it may be harder so i personally would say it's probably best to to keep some of that control and, and maybe set collaboration days or team days so that there is the expectation to still meet up with everybody as a team or just your manager or, or certain individuals within the team um does that answer the question or have i have i gone off topic there? <laughs> no no i think i think that's really good and i suppose the other yeah. thing is just about kind of company culture and obviously we have been working from home for a while but presumably yeah. some of those employees will have have been with the business for a while maybe as time goes on having the ability to have some in-person days or team days like you said especially mm. if there are new joiners or there's kind of some churn within the team that could be valuable as well yeah absolutely I think that that's one of the biggest things it's really hard to keep team dynamics going as they were before doing it virtually um you know a lot of employees have started to do you know daily zoom meet or teams meetings just to, to keep things going but it, it's not the same when when you're not face to face so so yes yeah, so assessing those, those collaboration days I, I think that's a great idea it it doesn't have to be weekly uh it could be monthly it could could be further apart it's, it's really again well, what works for you how far far spread out the employees are um but but there's a number of different things that, that you can do to to keep you know that team culture and, and dynamic going so again what, what you could do is, is kind of look at gaining employee feedback and finding out you know what works for your team um how are they going to stay engaged with each other and what can you do that that will engage them going forward to make sure that that doesn't drop off yeah no absolutely that's really good okay i think we've got one final one um so it's we have had very split feedback from our staff as to what measures they'd like to remain in place moving forwards. Um, the main difference seems to be that half of them are happy to return with no restrictions in place at all, whereas the other half are still concerned over social distancing. Um, given kind of the size of our offices and how that works in terms of getting everybody back in, what, what should they do? How can they kind of handle that difference in request especially if it's going to impact kind of how many people they can have in the office at one time i suppose yeah so so similar to, to my previous answer you could look at actually setting up something like a staff focus group where you actually get feedback from all employees as to how you know, how, how do you want us to accommodate this what is going to work for you going forward um 
I mean, the good thing about staff focus groups are, is, of course, the employees feel heard. Um, they've had that opportunity to put in their opinion um, and potentially have, have their request heard and, and considered. So um, in, in that circumstance, what, what you could do is, is even throw out some possible options for them to discuss during the, those focus group sessions. Um, so again, it, it, it really depends on you as a business and what's going to work for you, but you, you could look at potential options such as setting up different zones within the office. Um, so that could be, you know, here's one social end um, down, one social zone down one end um, where, you know, people don't have a problem with social distancing. They're happy to sit together to, to speak to each other face to face. Um, and down the other end, we could have or on a different floor if you've got room for it, like a socially distant zone where, of course, the desks are spaced um, and people in that choose to work in those zones know that, you know, that everyone here wants social distance. We can speak, but from from that, that two meter safe distance. So. Um, that way, of course, again, um, employees, uh, they have the, the discretion to, to pick and choose how they want to work and what suits them. Um, a, another option that seems to be quite popular with, with some clients is having something like those colour coded wristbands or badges that, that you've probably heard of by now. What, whatever is available, what, whatever colourful you, you can think of to place on your employees. But um, basically, they, they'd come into to the office and they can pick. So, for instance, if you went with badges, either a green and amber or a red badge. Um, so a green would be, you know, I'm, I'm fine with anything. I, I don't really mind anymore. I'm not socially distancing. I'm OK for you to come and talk to me. Um, amber would be, I'm OK with talking. Um, I just don't come too close. I don't really want to be touched. <laughs> um, and red would just be, I'm socially distancing. I, you know, talk to me only from a distance. And please, please don't come too close or touch me. So. So yeah, if you throw out those options, you know, you're you're accommodating your employees, um, you're allowing them to, to exercise their, their own discretion in line with their own personal preferences. And really that that relates back to the government guidance now, which is obviously putting the onus on, on individuals to, to manage this. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose, especially if you're kind of just starting to get everybody back in, I suppose if you can err on the side of caution as an employer and allow people who are kind of more nervous to get used to the um kind of environment of coming back in and then maybe doing another survey to see how they feel in a couple of months time it might be that those individuals are more relaxed by then and, and then that could allow you to flex up the way that people are working in the space yeah that's exactly yeah i think it is just about easing people back as i say there there will be some people that are happy to jump back in as normal like nothing's happened and there will be some that are nervous so so yeah, accommodating those that are nervous, doing what you can for now, and as you say, kind of reassessing that further down the line, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Get back to normal normality. <laughs> <one there. laughs> I've got another one where where someone's said, um, "Have we?" It's probably too soon, I suppose. But has anybody looked at the benefits of home or hybrid working in terms of impact on sickness, absence, career, uh, carers leave, productivity? Have we had any kind of research published on that yet? Or I suppose it probably does also depend um, on different industries and on different companies yeah. and, and the way that people are working. I'm not I'm not so sure about what's been published as such. I, I know from clients that I've worked with, we've actually seen the opposite. It's um, had, had the opposite effect on sickness absence. Um, so employees before if, if you wake up in the morning and you think oh I don't feel right today I'm just going to call in sick um, and they wouldn't have gone to work if they were expected to go to the office but with working from home people don't call in sick so so quickly you know they wake up they can you know if you woke up say at 7 a.m you can be like don't start work till nine I'll hit snooze I'll have a bit of a lay in and see how I feel and then wake up and just think well maybe I still don't feel great I'll see how see how I go for the rest of the day um, so they actually tend to, to work more than, than if, if they were expected in the office. So it's, yeah, again, and like I say, no black and white answer. It, it's different for every business. But but yeah, it, it really does depend on your workforce and, and what works for you. But but yeah, if you've got the option for people to work from home when they don't feel 100 percent, it it does. It acts as a deterrent of, of people coming sick in, into the office as well. Of course, you know, they, they can still work from home. They've got that option. They will still get paid they've not got to worry so much about you know missing out on on full pay and getting ssp which is obviously considerably less so 
so yeah I, I don't know so much about what, what's been published but I know from my experience yeah that it's, it seems to have had the, the reverse effect on, on absence yeah no that that's good okay I think I think we've gone through all those questions now so unless there are any others in the next couple of seconds I think um we'll close off so thank you very much and thank you everybody for joining for today's session Thank you.